right. Hello, hello, and welcome, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bim After Dark Live. This is episode 85 or 86. I don't remember now. I think it's 86. <laughs> episode 86 of Bim After Dark Live. And we are going to be talking about architecture, interior design, and landscape architecture um, as it relates to Revit and as it relates to everyone playing nicely. Uh, we got a returning guest. Uh, you guys know him from multiple episodes uh, over, over the years here. Um, uh, Aaron Mahler, and I'll introduce him soon. Um, before we jump in, just some, some housekeeping. This is a live show. If you're here tonight, Thursday night, uh, November 10th, then feel free to uh, chat, and I will be keeping an eye on it, ask questions, heckle, do whatever you want. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on it as we go along, and uh, and I'll be feeding questions to Aaron uh, as they make sense. Um, thank you for joining from wherever you are in the world. we got some 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 folks, um, uh, some returning audience. Okay, we've got some new audience members here, so thank you guys uh, for joining. Um, and as usual, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, we got quite a few more episodes of this show as well as a bunch of other content I've got um, coming up on the, on the YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Uh, we're at like 62,000. So let's keep, let's keep rolling. See how, see how far we can make this thing go. And finally, uh, before we jump into the contents, I did want to mention that uh, this episode is uh, supported by uh, the BIM After Dark community. And so for those of you that don't know what the BIM After Dark community is, it is a private community um, hosted by yours truly. Um, but really, it's a place where I hosted my four uh, major courses um, with the uh, uh, goal of not only having full length courses with sample files and all that, but also a social aspect of it um, in which you guys have the ability to not only interact with me, but interact with other members of the community. And so as you can see here, uh, this is what the community looks like for anyone interested in seeing inside the community there. I actually just lost my mouse. That's pretty bizarre. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and so this is uh, the main feed. You can see there's all kinds of conversations going on. Um, this is Carlos, who's uh, talking about uh, actually groups, groups and links and, uh, and duplexes and all kinds of stuff, which is in a uh, topic that Aaron came on once uh, in the past to talk about. Uh, we're talking about some railing issues and so on and so forth. So we have some some general general conversations. We also hold office hours, which are basically Zoom calls with myself and whoever shows up as far as members are concerned. Usually anywhere from six to uh, six to nine members come on, and we talk about whatever's on your mind. Uh, in this previous uh, office hour, we talked about um, adding areas and area calculations to room color legends. Uh, we also talked about some Enscape stuff. Um, we've had some guests on there as well like Paul Aubin, and not to mention I also have um, sample files from some of the tutorials and so on and so forth of, uh, that you've seen along, along the way. So if you, if you are interested in, uh, in joining the community, I'm running a Zoom, Zoom doing, I'm running a, uh, <clears throat> a sale from now until the end of this season, which will be the end of the year, which is 30% off. So head on over to community.bimafterdark.com if you're interested and come hang out with us. So with all that said and done i see we've got uh hey stan what's going on stan and timo cool all right let's let's bring in uh aaron aaron Mahler. let me just undo your your audio because i don't want people to, i don't want you to start talking and then no one hears you <laughs> there we go <laughs> <laughs> that was weird. how's it going zoom, everyone zoom decided to remove my mouse for a second there and so i saw things <laughs> highlighting but whatever uh so nice. welcome to the show aaron Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me back. It's of always course. fun to it's always fun to be here. I'm glad the schedule's worked out. We're heading to ASLA tomorrow. So oh, perfect timing then. Hop, I guess. A, hop on a flight at like seven in the morning. Yeah, awesome. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and you you haven't been on the show in a little bit, uh, <clears throat> mainly because I was I was giving you a little space with the addition of a of a third <laughs> in your family. I knew you probably needed some time there. But uh, but I did have John and and uh, and Lauren, I think was on in the past. So so I think we are still keeping a streak of having at least one parallax team member in every season of BIM After Dark Live so far. So, so that's pretty cool. I try not to feel guilty about it. I'm like, we don't want to monopolize. Nah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, you, you guys always bring awesome content and have great perspectives on things and always different perspectives, and so which is great. And so uh, anyone who hasn't seen the previous episodes that Aaron was on, um, I'll link them below. But uh, I believe the first one had to do with filters or templates. Uh, the second was about templates. I don't remember. The, there's filters in Revit, templates in Revit, and then we talked about uh, links and groups. Oh, um, that's right. The groups yeah, one. I forgot about that one. one. That was a good one. That was a good one. And uh, and then I believe you did join for the 50th episode where we had like 20 of us on. That's right. Call. That's right. So, the uh, uh, Marvel. So Aaron... <laughs> I, I was the I was uh, I was the fox. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so He's so Aaron, fox, Aaron's been on the show before. But before we jump into it, I think for anyone who's new here, maybe hasn't hasn't doesn't know who Aaron Mahler is. Maybe give everyone a little little intro on, on who you are, what you do and, and, and why uh, why we're chatting here. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my name is Aaron Maller. Uh, I'm in Dallas right now, originally from New York. My background was in uh, building architecture. I went to school for architecture, jumped into architecture in like 05. And right out of school, there was a company that was like, hey, we're doing this thing, modeling and producing drawings from it. It wasn't in Revit at the time. It was in Digital Project. But the moment I saw it, I was like, oh, my gosh, we're never just flat drawing again. This is going to change everything. Um, and it has. And over the years, I've Ended up using all the different software, Digital Project, Vectorworks, ArchiCAD, Revit, eventually. Um, and then I've spent like the last 15 years focused on that and wanting to see architecture like go to the next level, you know, see design enhanced, but also see the whole process like not fall on its face. Um, I think there's so much value that's in these models, but so many folks are like focused on, well, I just need to hammer out a set of drawings and who cares what the model's like. And then everything falls apart. You know, the whole premise that I saw in 05 of this is going to change the whole world. Well, it's not going to change the whole world if we all gimp it, right? Mm -hmm. So I've been focused on that. Started Parallax in 2015. Uh, we're a small consultancy. We just grew to six people. Congrats. Um, Congrats on that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Six people uh, normally in five cities, currently in two countries, because Melissa is over in Australia for the next month, which is really cool. Uh, and we're focused on just, yeah, helping, uh, I mean, not just architects, but engineers, uh, building owners, now landscape architects as well. And our goal is is fairly, it sounds fairly basic, but it's to help elevate you know, the fidelity of the model and the drawings so that everybody wins going downstream. And I really have a holistic, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's it. Like the better the model is, the better everybody does downstream. Right. 100%. And I, I think uh, that's, that's the challenge and the frustration for folks like you and I, uh, when, when, you know, when, when we know, we know the value of it, of it being there in three dimensions <laughs> and, and, and that, that challenge. So, so for those, for those uh, who don't know how I kind of, how I kind of set up these shows. Uh, there's usually two approaches. Uh, one is usually I'll reach out to someone like Aaron and, and, and we'll schedule a date and then uh, we'll eventually just figure out what a topic is. The other might be uh, uh, the, the speaker has a topic and we go from there. This was the, 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 the former um, and we kind of set up a date and then we were working on a topic throughout. And one of the things that uh, Aaron uh, brought up um, was this idea of, of the interaction, the integration, the collaboration, whatever you want to call it, um, between being architectural, uh, interior design and landscape. And so um, we'll hopefully get through all of it today. I think we'll probably start with in interior, get through landscape. For sure. I mean, for the, more, sure. the more I'm thinking about, like maybe we probably could have done two episodes, one with just interior, one with just landscape. We, but, we could, <laughs> yeah. But, but I think we'll try We'll try to touch on both. But I, I, like, I like that idea because so much of uh, collaboration with Revit is so focused on MEP, FP, um, so MEP engineers, um, structural and architecture. And I feel like uh, more and more interior designers are using Revit and more and more landscape uh, designers and architects are using Revit. And, uh, and so I think there's, there's, there's an area there that there's a little bit of knowledge lacking. And I could tell you in, in, you know, in my daily life, uh, uh, it is, even in the BIM after our community, um, just in the past couple of weeks, I've had discussions about similar stuff where it's an interior designer. Um, they're working in Revit with, another, with an architect who's a different firm. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, under trying to figure out who owns what, how to do it, how to best and most efficiently, uh, create their documents while also creating a usable model. And so I'm hoping that's what we can kind of take away from today is, is some best practices that I know you've, or lessons learned at a minimum <laughs> that I know that you're, you're kind of hacking through, uh, with your work at Parallax team. Definitely, definitely. And whether they're lessons learned or lessons perceived, we can talk about a little <laughs> yeah, bit. That's actually, yeah. it's, it's a big thing I, we, we try to talk about with customers, right? Because sometimes people perceive a lesson mm. and, you know, it's like, you know, when I, when I go to the doctor and I'm like, hey, I was eating broccoli last night and I had a heart attack. I should not eat broccoli anymore. Well, I, that's the lesson I perceived. Probably not a great idea, you know, <laughs> right, but, right, right. Uh, but definitely. <laughs> so, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of where we can start. I mean, you, you gave me a list here. I think, um, I actually think so. So I think you went with hosting first. I think I might want to start with redundancy first. That, uh, for some reason, I feel like that that that's kind of um, uh, when, whenever whenever I'm having this, these discussions, that's where it first starts. Is um, you know when it comes to architecture and interior design, especially right? We both do walls, right? <laughs> to some extent, yeah, we're both using absolutely. walls, right? We yep. might be both using floors. We might be both using ceilings, but we might be using them for different ways. So, so I'm just curious sure. how you want to sure. jump in the approach of just chatting about um, how, you know, again, you're, 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 you're at the way you've approached the challenge of, of redundant elements between maybe it's two models, the same model or, or, or so on. 
Yeah, definitely. And just to be fair, the list that I sent you was my brainstorming. I, yeah, should, yeah, yeah, I, should, yeah. I should have reordered it because I would not have put hosting for this either. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the redundancy discussion, right, doesn't even just come in between architects and interior designers. It happens between architecture and structure. It happens mm-hmm. between um, architecture and mechanical and electrical when you're looking at air terminals yeah. and you're yeah. looking at electrical and data. And I have a super unpopular point of view. Uh, and I'm going to just throw it out there and we'll let it marinate. But I promise everybody watching, if you actually follow it through on a project, you will live a much less stressful life in Revit. And that is all these discussions online are wrapped up in like, who's going to own the walls? Like the walls can only exist in one model. And for some odd reason, it's because we have this crappy phrase, the single source of truth. Mm. Let me tell you, it's a lie. <laughs> it's not a real thing. Uh, so, you know, between architecture and structure, who models the walls? Both. They absolutely both model them. Now, for anyone listening who's who's dealt with that pain in the butt, it obviously means that then there has to be some implementation in place. And I'm going to go to one of my old standbys, something I've said in like every one of our discussions, whether it's templates, filters, groups, whatever. A simple rudimentary naming convention can be all you need here. Hmm. Um, in the case of interior design, uh, now I'm going to assume for the purpose of the redundancy conversation, we're talking about um, you know, Big A and ID are not the same company. Right. Uh, because yeah. really what I want to talk about is when they're in the same company, they just need to be in the same model. And we'll talk about the growing mm-hmm. pains of that. But when they're not, okay, so they need to be, you know, in separate models because it's, you know, firm one and firm two, and they're not JV together contractually. So when they're in separate models, I mean, it's it's a fact of life. Architecture and interior design are both going to have to have walls. Right. Whether or not they're the same walls, you know, In my experience, the easiest thing is for interior design and architecture to both have the partitions in their model, because, you know, the moment interior design wants to use something that either has to host to a wall or, you know, needs to modify a wall, we get into situations where, you know, they can't because they don't have those elements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, what I really like to do, we have this going on in the project that we're working on right now, both between architecture and structure and all of the disciplines, We, we don't turn off even their category in their model we add in a filter that just knows to hide certain walls Mm -hmm. from the consultant's model and in the case of structure we don't want to turn off you know vg by link or vg rvt link walls because we'll lose all the foundations as well right we only want to hide walls that overlap with architecture Mm. i'll actually ask structure like hey can you just add a checkbox yes no parameter to your wall types so it's not by instance it's one per wall type Mm -hmm. and just call it overlaps with architecture, like super basic concept. (laughs) Um, And if they do that and they write, yes, gone out of all of my views, except, and this is the important part. We do keep an entire set of coordination views where that box is still turned on and we do see all their walls because what we're trying to avoid is firms that just jump in and they're like, oh, we just turn off one of their work sets that all the walls are on. We, you know, we, we unload it because now you can't see them at all, which means you're not coordinating. Right. Right. So you have to have a way to see it, but then pretty up the drawings. And that's really the goal that we're after. Yeah, no, I love that. And and I think, uh, um, you know, this is this, I think we probably talked about this when, when we were talking about filters and, um, and, and to me that you know, the, the first thing that I think people, and I think I might even read it in the chat already. You know, the per- first thing people think about is work sets, right. And, and all oh, let's use work sets, let's use work sets. And, um, you know, I guess before I give a little commentary, what, you know, what are your thoughts of that? If that's the initial approach that the firms are thinking of is I'll just use work sets instead so of filters, I, let's say. Yeah. So I think it's important to say, I don't want to chastise the idea because mm-hmm. if I'm in most firms shoes, it is the fastest and easiest approach to getting done. Right. Having said that, it's only the fastest and easiest approach because they don't have a template that has filters set up well. Right. Uh, the moment you engage in using filters for this sort of workflow instead of work sets, you'll immediately become aware of how much work sets are actually making your life harder. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I don't want to just be that person who's like, I mean, when I'm alone, I'm like, eh, forget the work sets. But, you know, <laughs> again, if you're in the 11th hour trying to get drawings at the door and filters and view templates aren't implemented in your firm, then work sets is your electric eraser on vellum, right. you know? <laughs> and, and that's and, the, and then that's that's what I see. I think people see the most benefits from it are is 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 it it's a way to sort of treat it like the visibility graphics like a category override uh, where you can globally shut and turn things off and on. Uh, but to your point, you know how, how much you know 
to, to what it, to, to what it, or to what detriment is that actually happening right it, it could be it could actually yeah. in the long run it could actually be hurting hurting the process so. well and i think everybody should always be aware of the biggest issue that i have with people that that hide work sets or unload work sets which is even scarier right is we're using it to serve a purpose and it's working well as long as nothing is accidentally on that work set that well, and, uh, yeah i was just gonna say that that, that alone you know make you know paying, absolutely paying attention to active work set on the bottom when you're working on a work set model you know that that's 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 a big thing right and and the second you don't realize you're in the wrong work set it's actually a, a major challenge uh to undo sometimes uh if if you've done sure you know, cross-pollinated sure. Yeah. work sets while you're yeah. just, you know modeling across a whole floor or something like that yeah, and and look, Melissa from our office, she'll tell you I'm the worst offender of work set control because I just I don't like it, I don't care about it, and on the few projects you don't even look do down it, at the bottom, right? I'm, I, like, I, I'm like that too. I barely even look I, at the I bottom. Forget. I forget. <laughs> Mel Melissa and I had an entire day once on a coordination project. We were both modeling the exact same staircase, and we didn't know because I was on the wrong work set, like a <laughs> jerk. And then we both synced the central. It's a testament to how bad those drawings were, by the way, that our staircases came out different. Yeah, that's pretty awful. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, so there's some and there's some interesting, you know, questions that are that are popping up in the chat too. So I mean, for me, the, the thing that I always like to tell people about work sets is imagine that you're using a work set and your goal is to hide structural CMU walls because architecturally you also have CMU walls and you need to show yours for fire rating. Mm -hmm. But the structural engineer has accidentally put a two foot by two foot column on the structural wall work set. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know what's there? Is it in your drawings? It's, you know, it's a coordination nightmare. And we see that on a lot of projects, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially it's, that's a great point because, you know, you're, you're also, you, 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 you can be pulling in elements of different categories too with work sets, right? Where, whereas if you're using a filter, for example, or even visibility graphics, I mean, to, to even if you're customizing the link through categories, right? then then your your filter can be applied to specific categories as opposed to blanket model elements that are in that work set and so that that's a valid point there you could have railings and god only knows what else modeled on that work set yeah absolutely absolutely i mean and you also get into you know the more granular issues of you know when you start looking at repetitious units and patient rooms and hotel suites and and apartments where things are grouped uh, you know, Revit doesn't treat work sets the way CAD treated layers. Hmm. Um, you get into the whole, the work set of the group versus the work set of the objects within the group. And that becomes a non-starter very quickly if your workflow entails needing to shut off only specific things from a consultant mm -hmm. and it's all grouped and you now can't shut off only individual things. Right, right, right. So it's the, the trick is, you know, our, our workflow with a lot of filters and a lot of strong view templates, it takes a little more time to set up in your template. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, I, I tell everybody that we teach, it's not the fastest thing today. It's the fastest thing for the duration of the project. Mm -hmm. We don't want the gotcha in the 11th hour, which is what Revit is infamous for. It's really not Revit. It's just us and our decision-making skills. Definitely. So, so let's, let's break down uh, this, this concept then for, for folks who maybe don't even have any idea what we're talking about when it comes to filters sure, and stuff. Cause, sure. cause it, we, it's easy for us to get, to go off on this tangent. We're seeing Revit in our minds and doing all this, right? But Absolutely. I think, I, think, I think maybe just showing uh, a quick example of potentially how, how, how you can manage and have two walls exist in two models uh, for folks. So I'm, I'm ID and you're a, you know, architecture. Yeah, absolutely. And we have one model. If, if you can potentially just, just sort of walk, walk through a quick example of that for people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, so you want me to do it? Yeah, yeah the... go, go for it, man. Yeah, they're, cool. They're, they're so seeing your screen. Sweet. Okay. So this is just a, this is a, this is a building that we're working on right now with a client of ours. Um, it's kind of fun because Parallax is actually involved in the day-to-day -day on this job. We are the modeling team. We are the documentation team. Now, keep in mind this project a little bit different because as it pertains to architecture and ID, we have actually convinced both teams to get inside one model. Mm. But the conversation is still relevant because right. for a while ID was in a separate model mm -hmm. and structure of course is still in a separate model. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at four plans of the exact same spot, um, just to give a quick outline. This one's obviously furniture. That's why you see a lot of furniture. Mm -hmm. This one is what uh, interior design calls a reference plan, which is where they show annotations and things like that. We've got a floor finish plan, and you can see here that like all the particular floor finishes are actually modeled in here, and you're seeing floor finish tags. And then we've got our, our bread and butter architectural plan down here. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine down in this view, there's probably a whole bunch of you know walls and things that we don't necessarily want to see from other models. We're still early on in this project, so I know the walls don't all line up. That's why I'm going to go somewhere and show you some walls that don't line up. But as an example, if we were to go in, uh, 
to, I got to go into the viewport, I suppose. If we go into any view template in the parallax environment, and this came up in your other broadcast, of course, mm -hmm. there's a truckload of filters that are in every view. Now, most of these are just from our standard template. So everything basically from here and down is not really what we're talking about right now. This is all just everyday stuff that we use. So I did see a question in the chat about like, what is the max number of filters you can have in a view? I don't think we have that many, but we're at about 50 in every single is, view is template. There, I don't think there's a max, right? Is, is there if there max? is, I've never, if there is, I've never seen it. I'm actually <laughs> right. now tempted. If, I'm not if tempted you to haven't just... found it, then I don't think it's there because I don't think I know anyone who uses filters more than you. So if you haven't found the max, then I just don't think it exists. Or if it does, it's like insanely large. <laughs> I've actually, I've actually seen some MEP firms that, that would rival easily the amount I we have. Yeah, I could see that. So yeah, so your MEP firms, right, are divided into by systems or by filters. Mm -hmm. And the by filter houses, they've easily as many, like mm -hmm. four times as many mm -hmm. as us. <laughs> now, now, right now in this particular model, uh, it's a little disingenuous because uh, I, I guess we did turn it back on. Uh, no, so so all of the walls are probably off from structure at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a temporary thing because uh, they're really behind and just you know getting caught up to what changes we just made and I had to print some drawings. Mm -hmm. So normally I'll show you what we would do here. And so you're gonna see uh, a bunch of things kind of come back to life inside this view. It's a, it's a cluttered view. We have a lot going on in here. Um, and then I'll jump back in the filter dialog and we actually have two sets of filters built. And okay, so here you go. Now, as an example, you'll see that there's two sets of CMU walls there and that's because we moved an elevator shaft. So this is basically what we wanna do. Mm -hmm. We wanna just say, it's a filter that looks for walls in the structural link. It finds all of the CMU. And in this particular example, um, we'll go in and we'll take a look at that filter. It's on the other screen, so you can't see it. Wah, wah. Uh, so what we're looking at here is we're looking for anything in the wall category that has uh, CMU in uh, the type name and then uh, does not equal non-bearing. And the reason I'm doing that is just because um, oh, I think I remember what the issue is here. And that is that um, this particular engineer actually copied our wall type in. So I believe when I do this, this is going to backfire gloriously. <laughs> you can all watch me have a have a funny moment. Uh, let's see, that is enabled. So let's go back and edit that. And we'll just put this on. We'll turn this one off. So what we're going to just have is we're going to just search for CMU. And you will see that this is going to... Um, fall a little bit on its face because we haven't worked this out with this particular engineer yet. So we're going to color all of the walls um, orange, but it's going to get ours as well, right? So what we'll normally do now is if you imagine if the engineer has done that thing we talked about where we said add in this yes, no parameter that just says scope overlap or mm -hmm. something, we'll then add that into that filter. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll go right back in here. We'll say CMU. And in this filter, we'll say walls also contain uh, you know, scope mm -hmm. overlap equals yes. And what that'll do is it will take the engineer's walls and hide them, but our walls will stay. And you can do that for all of your disciplines. You can do it for ID. You can do it for structural. And here's the best part. I used the scope overlap, yes, no parameter. You're asking your engineer to do it. All that stuff's kind of bananas if you don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. You can make a dynamo graph using nothing but out-of-the-box nodes, no managing packages, no anything, and all that graph does is your consultant runs it and it just writes the name of their file in every object in the model in some random text field. <laughs> That's all you need it to do. Yeah. Search, search for STR in the comments field mm -hmm. if it's structure. And the best thing is they don't have to do any work to do that. They just have to open it and run it. Right, right. So. So this is not a great example because, of course, it, it jacked it, up it our walls as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but you'll notice. So we have one of these for uh, we have one of these for CMU walls. We have one of these for foundation walls. And interestingly enough, because this is all wood framed and the engineer has uh, stud packs basically throughout the entire model, we have one for their two by six walls as well. And we just ditch those in plan. We keep the stud packs. So we get to see, you know, their kind of, you know, bound together framing members, but we get to turn off their actual individual stud layers. Uh, mm -hmm. There's you know, a, there's the a good question in, in the, in the chat um, about um, when you're, when you're using, when you're, when you're having the redundancy of the walls in each model, how are you managing openings like doors and windows and stuff like that? You know, which, which again would be traditionally, right. That would be the architect would be laying that out. And then the other consultants would basically just be following along with, you know, what that design as it evolves, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and so if I go, you know, just to a different file for a second here, uh, just to give another example. So in our in our template, what we always set up is what we call um, we have a whole suite of different coordination views, mm -hmm. and the intent of these views, this one, you'll obviously see it looks ridiculous. Everything is a bright color. But the goal of everything being a bright color is you can identify where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to managing openings, this is one of those views where we would not have the structural walls hidden. We would use the same filter to turn them a different color. Mm -hmm. And the goal then is if I have a wall and structure has a wall and they have openings in different spots, you'll see the color. Like if you take this example, mm -hmm. if structural's wall was colored pink and their opening was in a different spot, you'll see this. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a line there. Now that one you might not see if it's covered up, but you can look to the openings and immediately identify where they are. Um, and it's it is manual. It's it's manual coordination, but right. the goal is just to make it easier to find it. And, and, and yeah, no, no, no. It, I, I guess so. So then, in that case, it would the 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 structural engineer or the interior designer, et cetera. They um, you know they would be putting openings in, but in theory, they wouldn't really care about what families they're using, for example, for those openings, right? It doesn't. Do you, if you don't, let's say, I mean, obviously you could always just coordinate with the architect and use the same doors and stuff, but let's, you know, you could probably just put any door in as long as the opening size is the same as the architects, right? Yeah, you can. So this is where, and again, you know, keep in mind that in a perfect world, what I prefer to do is to try to get everybody in, you know, not everybody. I don't want to, I want to rephrase that carefully <laughs> when it's architecture and interiors. I want to try to get everybody in one model mm -hmm. um, with structure. I actually, th there's an interesting approach that I like to take and it is to keep an entire library of your doors to send to your structural engineers, but with a caveat there. And that is, you know, it's a one-time initiative to take your entire door library, do a save as, and delete all the geometry except the openings. Hmm. And what you're after there is just think about the workflow of I tab select, I copy, I paste a line, same place, and I switch the type. Hmm. We do it all the time when we want to like temporarily copy in a column for a rendering or something. Mm -hmm. The goal is if I can have a structural engineer come in to a particular door opening and they can tab select it and they can copy it and then paste it into their model and then swap it for the version that's called no geometry mm. and the opening's exactly in the same spot. It's just no longer having a frame or panels. Right. That's kind of a great spot to be in. That is. Yep. Yep. And I guess in theory, uh, I guess the wall would have to be there, but, um, because you could copy individual elements through a link. So in theory, you could tab to the architectural link, copy, paste, and then just flip it out for non-geometry. So that's pretty Yeah, cool. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. Uh, and we, you know, uh, way back in like 2013, 20, 2012, um, when I was still at Beck and we were working on the very tall church uh, in South Korea, that was actually an approach that we used to model fireproofing on top of steel, steel mm -hmm. framing as well. Mm -hmm. So at the time we had a family that was just fireproofing. And so you would tab select the structure, copy mm -hmm. it, paste it into your model and then we switch it, it for the fireproofing family. And it would add on to all the structural members. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, folks that listen may hear some of this and be like, well, this sounds like super manual. And there's an interesting thing I, we tell customers and that is don't ever discount the amount of time you spend fighting with software, trying to get it to automate something mm -hmm. when yes, we're talking about a few minutes of, you know, labor, because the goal is it's supposed to be eliminating the labor. It's the goal is not to automate. The goal is to be faster and more efficient. Right. And we want to automate where we can, obviously, mm -hmm. but we don't want to fight with computers over copying a door opening. It's a, it's a silly hill to die on. Mm -hmm. it's a, to that to that uh, to that extent or point. Um, how about? And I guess maybe because of the limitations, but uh, within this m methodology, um, have do you do you use or? or or explore copy monitoring for any of this if you have uh, elements in both models or because of the limitations of copy monitoring, you don't even bother. <laughs> copy monitor and I are not friends. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were um, going to go there because I also, I, it's, 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 it, it can be a great tool, but I just find that there's so many limitations to copy monitoring that um, it ends up blowing up in most people's faces and then they end up just ignoring the coordination uh, warnings that come up and, and just breaking, uh, you know, and un unmonitoring everything at the end of the day anyways. Almost every single client model that we get asked to get into on 360 that is employing copy monitor, the first thing that comes up when I open the model is like 55 coordination alerts. And when I ask about it, 
what they generally say is, yeah, we don't know what that means. And we were going to ask you about it. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. right, right, right. My, my bigger issue with copy monitor is I, I love, I love what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. And I often like lament, you know, to John Pearson, like, oh man, if you just had like 8 billion, you know, free hours with nothing to do, we could like try to make a way better copy monitor. Mm -hmm. The problem is the way they've put the rules together it doesn't look at the decisions that need to be made holistically. It looks at them one item at a time. Right. And when you look at levels and grids alone, the primary function of copy monitor, it's a problem when somebody adds in a grid and then renumbers a bunch of grids mm. because you get to grid number three and it says coordination alert. We'd like to turn you into grid number four. And you say, okay, but there currently is a grid number four because the next step is it's going to turn that into grid number five. Right. And it doesn't know, it's not smart enough to like work in descending order. Mm -hmm. So you just, you end up in a daisy chain of, I don't know what to do here. <laughs> That's um, exactly my experience with Copy Monitor too. But yeah, but, and, but, and but I mean, it, 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 the concept of it, it would be great for what absolutely. we're talking about here, where you can, you know, this is a unique element in this model. This is a unique element in this model. And let's just track these together to see if, you know, something changed, right? <laughs> absolutely. And honestly, I think there, I, I think there's enough of, uh, there are enough, uh, there's enough of an ecosystem out there now that it's ripe for somebody to basically homebrew a better copy monitor because we have interop capability with all of these applications now that are like reading model data and transmitting it through things like, you know, speckle or whatever else. And mm -hmm. I don't care if you want to go super trashy XML file, that's just element IDs and locations and dates and whatever else. I mean, somebody could build an interface that would just watch what one file is doing and alert somebody in the other file to what's happening mm -hmm. and make it a heck of a lot smarter than copy monitor is so so, um, so uh so i'm just thinking workflow now to those those folks out there thinking about you know this this redundant redundancy approach uh i guess we could call it redundancy approach but <laughs> approach to <laughs> redundancy uh and and sort of um you know when i think of walls when i think of doors windows floors just general modeling um, would the approach then be what you're saying there where it's, it's, it's copying from like, especially with interiors where, uh, for the most part, there's going to be a lot of redundancies as far as what's there, right? That is, if they're in separate models, let's say for that example, sure. um, you know, the, it would, it would, I think it would potentially be a little silly to, to click and draw and drag and, 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 and draw and sketch every object if the architect already did it. So I'm assuming right. what you're saying is, is in theory, you're going to be using those elements initially you know, at, at some point in time during design and then flipping them out to your model. And then that's where you're based from. You're not, you're not asking an interior designer to go and link in the Revit, just rebuild all the architecture. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I, I would hope, you know, and again, so this is, this is theorizing that it's two different firms and they are kind yes, of working right. in, in, in different worlds because they have to, I would hope they are collaborative enough that the architecture team is saying, you know, whether it's tab selecting or opening our model and copying, pull this stuff out because mm -hmm. If you're an architect out there and you're telling the interior designers to remodel it all from scratch just because, <laughs> that's lame. Right, um, right. Because they're going to trace what you're doing anyway. <laughs> so I, I want them to get I want them to get up and running as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And literally, I wouldn't even do the tab select and copy and paste because it's super tedious. I would say Take open the architectural model, mm -hmm. identify, and the way I actually do it is I create a 3D view and I hide you know, temporary using temporary hide isolate, I hide everything that I don't want to copy mm -hmm. and I keep vetting it by window selecting. And when I have it down to where I want it, I do a brute force copy and paste aligned to the other model. Mm -hmm. And then we're off to the races provided again, you got to have those coordination views set up though, where you can be reviewing um, and comparing what's in your model to what's in the other model, because it is true that now, you know, you have to deal with the fact that every time architecture moves a wall, interior design has to move a wall. Right. Correct. Yeah, which to some extent, like I think what you're what you're getting at is if you go through this in a in a project, um, th there, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because because when when you think about it, like just like what you were showing that example um, of that of that elevator shaft, right? If if you weren't being forced to to sort of go check these things, then those are where we see all these issues where you know uh, the the x y and z consultant is behind the design because of the sure. fact that they're using let's say the architectural background for their for theirs 
and they didn't even realize it shifted and so they never updated their stuff to match it and i mean i see that all the time sure right? sure time. now full transparency i want to give all these engineers a big kudos because like they literally got that change like 48 hours ago yeah. so you know i'm <laughs> yeah, just we're, like, not, we're, know, not, I, we're not digging on the engineers in this no <laughs> no but i mean this this is a fun project because we're in there modeling it you know with our client like and all the engineers and they're all being rock stars about it but i just want to make sure i throw that out there because you know, the reason that elevator is off is we literally just moved it the other day. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're working on that as we speak, but yeah. yeah. So, so let's, let's talk, um, uh, whether, whether we're in the same model or we're linking, um, um, the approach to, um, we'll, we'll stay on walls, I guess for now, um, the approach to things like finishes, paints, and the mm -hmm. kind of stuff that I think is always at odds between architects sure. and designers, because at the end of the day, the architect, you know, they, they're going to model the drywall, but the, into your designer wants to paint the drywall let's say right and they or at least as far as the documentation is concerned but also the model so i'm just curious on your approach as to that whether i guess we can because your example is is in the same model we can maybe just show that and then maybe just talk about the the linked the linked approach yeah sure absolutely saying, and and so and so this gets and this gets into another discussion right which is one of the one of the other conversations i always like to have is so why is arc and id in separate models and again in the conversation of they're two different firms they're under separate contracts totally get it that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. we see a lot of firms where arc and interiors are in the same firm and they work in different models and there's a couple of interesting reasons for that uh one of the first that we hear is um Sorry, I lost my train of lost my train of thought. Um, so cartooning differences, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And Parallax is guilty of this as well. Until two months ago, everything in our template was focused on architecture. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole architecture set of drawings. There were seven thousand sheets, you know, 50, 50 floors, all these plans, mm -hmm. twenty different plan types, all focused on architecture. And we actually had a client come to us, and they're like, "Everything in this template is amazing, but ID wants all the same stuff. Should we just do a save as to the template and convert the A's to I's?" And, we actually said, holy cow, should we consider a world mm -hmm. where there is an entirely separate template just for interior or, or there's an entirely separate series of sheets just for interior design? Mm -hmm. And if I could find it right now, it's being a little weird. So one of the one of the newest things that we actually added into our template is that now interior design, they never should have been, but they are not second class citizens in the template anymore. They have everything that architecture has, mm -hmm. their own cartoon set of sheets their own cartoon set of plans, their own elevation markers that show up in their plans that do not show up in the architecture plans, their own section markers that mm. show up in the in interiors plan and don't show up in the architecture plans. And the same thing is true for in for architecture as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the architecture views don't show up in the interior views. So one of the big reasons that we always hear ARC and ID are separate is, well, we don't want to deal with their stuff. Like when they start modeling, their stuff shows up in our model. Like, holy cow. That's super low bar, easy to fix, <laughs> like so easy to fix. Um, and the interesting thing is you should want their stuff showing up in your model, like right. all day long. Um, so whether it's furniture, whether it's finishes, um, we want to see everything that's going on interior design wise in a model mm -hmm. as, you know, as it pertains to your question about modeling finishes, right? So, you know, we want everything to be discrete thicknesses in real locations in the model. And this is important because one of the other reasons I hear ARC and ID separated into separate files is because I'm a ball buster and I don't like to tolerate like we're only going to model it like halfway. So floor thicknesses, yeah, they got to be at the right elevation. If carpet's thicker than wood, that sucks. Raise it up mm -hmm. or use roofs as Jacob Small likes to make fun of me for saying on Twitter. Um, but yeah, so we'll we'll actually model in all the finishes. We'll put them at the correct elevation so that everything, you know, is is not coplanar. You're not getting Z fighting when you're in Enscape and you're rendering. Mm -hmm. um, it means you're going to see every transition properly. Mm -hmm. uh, wall finishes, my rules are if it's thicker than wallpaper, it's a wall type. Mm -hmm. So if it's wallpaper or paint, then we're using the Revit paint tool. And that's where for your separate firms in their two models, you have to have the redundancy. Right. You can't use the paint tool on a wall that's not in your file. Right, exactly. And I think that's where the... I think that's where it all, the question always comes up. If you're in a link and the and the wall doesn't exist in your model, you can't paint it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you can't paint it. And, and here's where it gets doubly fun. That's why you also want to have that filter set up really well. Because mm -hmm. if you do copy the wall in and you paint it and you go to Enscape or Twin Motion or Lumion or whatever you like, it's going to be instant Z fighting because you're going to have the arc and the interior's oh, yeah. wall both Flicker doing this. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So you just have those filters set up right away so that you can just kill that stuff. And 
I mean, you'll be, and, and, you know, I have to say for me, Enscape was the thing that changed the importance of interior design. Mm. Um, I will now say interior design really can make or break the success of a Revit model um, for both design and construction. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can speak to this, right? So, you know, we're, uh, John Marlowe, who joined Parallax recently, we've been working on some kind of really fun initiatives behind the scenes related to hospitality and, and the interiors of what happens in the hospitality world. And I go back to projects that we did, um, the, the hotel that you probably saw that we were working on in Navisworks uh, several years ago at this point, but curtains uh, seem like a not important thing <laughs> until you start factoring in that they're getting mounted in a cove right near uh, the edge of a slab up against a series of curtain wall or, you know, depending on the hotel, you know, type. Mm -hmm. And I look at things like this and then I start looking at things that get done in typical details in architectural drawings or interiors, or interiors drawings. Especially, yes. Both, I mean, both architecture and interiors, but even the Absolutely. interiors part of architecture is still so so many drafted drafted views right some cat, cat absolutely drafted views from Ab absolutely and one of my favorite two things to look at is when you're considering both where the shades mount you know to the underside of a slab and how that interfaces with a curtain wall and my absolute favorite is the sill extension that happens on storefronts <laughs> and curtain walls which never make their way into a model ever so this is, a, this is a parallax model from several years ago that Melissa and I built. But I mean, this is legitimately in the architectural model and interiors model, everything stopped right here. Yep. And it's not the hole in the floor that bothered me. It's that there were areas where these storefronts and curtain walls didn't run all the way to the wall. And there was always this question of like, what happens over here when this thing just stops? <laughs> you know, is there a wall there? Is it a trip hazard? Like what happens? And I don't like to think of it as these are problems that you can solve inside of a Revit model so much as these are opportunities to say, we're not going to stand around and solve this in the field. All we have to do is put it in the interiors model and, mm -hmm. and we look like rock stars. So <laughs> it's a family, just drag it on the floor and be on your way. Yep. Yep. Not to mention if you throw uh, motorized shades in there, then you're... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. A motorized, motorized shades. Actually, so on the one we were just looking at, they were motorized. And yeah. they, they just weren't in that 3D image. But oh yeah. my goodness, the coordination and the structure for them and is the is the recess big enough in the ceiling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so all these things. Yeah, these things are huge. So so, so you mentioned ceiling, you mentioned floors. So, um, so ceilings then, I guess, to that extent, um, that's something where there's, I think there's, there's also a, a little there's some redundancy issues there where I'm curious how, how it's been solved, where ideally, I mean, I guess in, in the normal workflow, the architect is usually modeling the ceilings typically. I mean, I guess the interior design, if it's, it, it depends, there's definitely a big connection piece there, but, um, but usually there's a reflected ceiling plan. And then in my experience, the ceilings are just called out as a type in the finished plan for the, for the ID. And then there may never even be an interior design finish plan or whatever for reflected ceiling plans, right? And so I'm curious how how maybe you've seen that be playing out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we actually had we had a team meeting on our project team today and we had this very discussion because currently, and again, in our project, we're lucky because we're all in one model together. Right. But in this project, we actually have both architecture RCPs and interior RCPs. And it was just a great conversation of, hey, there's certain things that we would normally document on the architecture RCPs, and there's the stuff that we know you're documenting on the interior RCPs, we either have to agree that it's all going in one drawing, mm -hmm. or we can have two RCPs. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, but the same rules apply, and I'll tell you why. Uh, obviously, the folks watching may be aware, even with face-based families, they don't cut linked models. Right. And for us, that's a really big deal because a lot of our view styles and how we want to see things, like the way these lights pop and they poche like this, it's predicated on they've cut a hole in the ceiling. Right. Because that is the geometry of the light fixture that is colored. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want that, but we also want it for 3D coordination. I want to be able to shut off my light fixtures and air terminals and see holes in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, yeah, if you're in two models, then it's the same deal. You know, we're going to copy and duplicate and then redundify, if you want to call it that, you know, mm -hmm. the the architecture and the interior ceilings, or we're going to just agree architecture doesn't have to have it. Mm -hmm. Ceilings are a little nebulous because I think you could make a case that architecture doesn't need them mm -hmm. if interiors is modeling them. Right. Um, I'm always having it in my architecture file. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, <laughs> the, the, and that's why I was bringing it up because it is something that kind of blurs the lines a little bit, right? Because when you think of for sure when you think of soffits and more you know, mm-hmm. intricate ceilings, then that that's an architectural element, right? Where Absolutely. It finishes themselves, so so I could see where that. But that's interesting. So so you are so ideally, right? Or ideally, I mean, it sounds like with the link, you're still redundant. You're, you still might want redundancy there because of the fact that, again, like you said, hosting to it or whatever you're doing to it for the sake of whatever that interior um uh but i guess to some extent so let's say let's say we're in a linked a link situation here um mm-hmm. or a, you know a, a separate model situation um and maybe there isn't going to be an interiors uh reflective ceiling plan um uh so in that case um but but maybe you want to do your you still want to do your finish tags in your finish plan or something like that that are referencing the ceilings you know is that that would you say that's just more of coordinating with the architect and making sure it's something that you can utilize or I, I think you get into and so that's like the super gray area right mm-hmm. and so like in that case what we're saying is would i trade the time or the duration to do the redundification for, you know in lieu of now i can place a tag in my model and it can we can tag obviously an object in a linked file mm-hmm. since like 2012 which is really cute mm-hmm. um but i tag the finish and it's the wrong finish oh geez now i'm like jumping on the phone or i'm writing an email to ask an architect hey can you go into this model and can you change the type mark of this finish on this ceiling and mm-hmm. he accidentally changes the finish on all the ceilings and now you're calling him back and you're grumpy and it's like hey He's duplicate <laughs> like duplicate and you've got an architect over there going i freaking hate interiors why do i got to deal with this and this is like this is the root of our issue right so let me just tell a quick story the first time i talked about the redundancy concept it was with an mep engineer in dallas Mm -hmm. and it was over this issue right here so we actually haven't had time to put air terminals in our architectural model yet Mm -hmm. so the air terminal you're seeing here is from mep Mm -hmm. now air terminals i'm a huge believer it's another area we actually have an entire chart of redundant objects in our bim execution document Mm -hmm. and it has been the best thing for collaboration ever because I told the MEP engineers, I don't want to bother you. I don't want to call you up and ask, like, why are your symbols on a different subcategory? And why aren't they generic annotations? Because your arrows are making my plans ugly. You know what? If that's the symbol that you want in your drawings, high five and go put it in. I'm going to drop my air terminal family right here. It's going to cut a hole in my ceiling. So I'm not going to see T-Grid running through the air terminal. And then uh, I'm going to align it in the right spot. We're going to have a little coordination discussion. And I'm not going to bug you about your content. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to bug you about getting it in the right spot. Obviously that's important, but I think right now we spend so much time fighting with each other because we think there can only be one of something in a model, but we all have to agree on how it's going to look. Hmm. And that's kind of bananas. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, I feel like that is going to be a Pyrrhic victory if we ever get there. Like, <laughs> man, we may win that battle, <laughs> but we're going to come out of it missing some limbs. And, you know, the flip side is, I'm advocating for, we have an extra RCP that's just called coordination. That's really ugly and everybody's stuff is turned on. And once a week we zip through it and just check for things that are out of whack. Yeah. I think, I think that's a pretty easy way to go. Now, obviously the other big consideration is when you're collaborating with folks downstream, like, like the GC or the subcontractors, you do have to delineate who's gets exported. Yes, and I think gets I think used. That, or, absolutely. Who's, who's to use. Yes, and, absolutely. And we have and those it, discussions now, even with just general you know, diffusers or light, well, light fixtures is usually the big Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yep. Electrical, yep. you know, electrical models usually have lights and architects usually have lights. And we're like, uh, which ones do you want Absolutely. to Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it should be, you know, it should be a really good conversation. I'm just on, I'm on the other screen looking because I know it's in here. I just have to, I have to remember which, which page it's on and I may fail at finding it on the fly. But yeah, that's the conversation is who's do we export? But I think it's also important to note that when we're having that conversation and we're saying, who's are we going to export? It should be a pretty quick conversation because they're supposed to be in the same spot. <laughs> right. I mean, usually the conversation is happening because they're not in the same spot, right? That's, that's well, that's usually in my experience when we're having the conversation is is when when there is a question about it. <laughs> fair, except in that case, I think we need to take a step back and have a look because what we're trying to do with our approach is we're not trying to absolve anybody from coordinating. Stuff does need to be in the right spot. You know, we told our engineers this week, like your lights and your air terminals got to be at the right height. They got to match the ceiling. They got to be in the right position. Mm -hmm. The the goal of the redundant approach is we're getting off each other's backs in terms of, you know, infighting on a week to week basis. But also, you know, we're focusing on the coordination and not on the software implications. So, you know, 
if my light fixture is a quarter of an inch different from the electrical engineer, I'm probably still going to ask him to fix it. But at that point, I'm hoping like what's really happening there is our ceiling grid is being laid out in an architectural drawing. And I hope the ceiling is getting installed before the lights hang in there. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, but you <laughs> no, know, but you know, you know, it also uh, kind of comes up that I was thinking about that. That's kind of neat. And so there's a couple of things I want to highlight first, which is for uh, sure. Uh, the fact that you keep mentioning coordination views, right? And and this is a huge, oh, huge. this is mm-hmm. huge for anyone watching this, whether whether we're talking what we're talking about today, interior architecture, whatever. If you're MEP, at just anything, anyone, anytime you're in Revit, you, you should 100, especially if you're bringing in linked models, you should 100 percent have at least one view that has everything turned on. So many issues come up because you're literally none, half the time you don't even realize that you're 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 doing things that are wrong right or you don't see other people's stuff whatever the other thing that's interesting with with this approach with the redundancy that that kind of came to mind as you were speaking there is um even that collaborative discussion um if you're trying to use let's say a diffuser right um you know and as the architect i'm looking at it like i actually want this diffuser to shift over six inches or whatever and and, and but i'm forced you know i'm being forced to use their terminal in my rcps then you're 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 setting up a meeting. You're having a call. You're saying, yeah, "Hey, go, this room, go there, click it over." As opposed to, I can actually adjust the whole room to how I want it to look, and then just tell them, "Hey, refresh your link." Yeah, and and boom, now yep. can you just adjust all your terminals to match mine? And that that yeah. actually is pretty cool. I never I, like I never even thought about that being a potential workflow. But then then you know, and vice versa, right? The engineer could say, "Hey, I just readjusted all the stuff. Can you refresh your link and see if you can adjust yours to my, whatever?" I mean, it depends yeah, on how they're working back yeah. and forth. So and, that's, that's and pretty I, neat. Yeah, and I'll do you one better. Set up the views for them. Hmm. Because I, I agree with you. And so we actually have several different coordination views. Hmm. And the, the big ugly, the one, I, I call it the big ugly, but the one that you're talking about is called find things here. And this is just the nastiness where everything is on. We give them a bunch of crazy colors because we're just like, the, the goal here is if you can't figure out why something's not showing up in another view, you can look at the color that it is here and then go to the filters. Like, why is this chair magenta? I'm not sure, you know, maybe I'll jump into my coordination view template and I'll go see like what things are magenta over here. And okay, so I've got something called include furnishings. That's magenta. Could it be that somebody checked a box called I'm furniture? Well, it is a chair. (laughs) You kind of learn. But if you really want to win over your consultants, here's something fun that you can do. Don't even just set up one view. We have a whole series of coordination views, one for just wall blocking, one for security, one for plumbing, one for mechanical, one for electrical. And what do they look like? If you go into the requirement for plumbing, this is what I want a plumbing engineer to look at, right? There's very little color here. Mm -hmm. You know, for $1,000, Alex, what items are colored in this view? (laughs) Things that the plumbing engineer has to care about. Mm -hmm. And so we tell them, hey, you know what? Set up a coordination view, set it up to buy linked view and tag our plumbing view. Mm -hmm. And what you'll get is a bathroom where you may not care that the partitions moved. Mm-hmm. But you may care that the floor drains that are kind of hidden under all the line work of the toilet stall, you know, and the toilets themselves, maybe they moved. Mm-hmm. So you can do this with RCPs. You can do this with floor plans. But I encourage folks like there's all this talk, you know, on social media about like, well, I don't want to like clutter up my built my file with like too many views. Forget it. Clutter yeah. it up with a ton of views. I mean, name them, know what they are. Right. Name but, them, I mean, organize them, categorize them, yeah. make, it, make it so it's not, you know, all under question mark, question mark, question for mark. For sure, top. for sure, <laughs> for sure. But just for as sure. an example, so our template has 55 levels in it. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven times two because of RCPs. So 14 times 55. Those are all just coordination views and they're just hanging out full time. Uh, but they'll pay you back dividends. You know, that's that's the thing is we're not here to build the leanest model we can. We're here to have the model work for us. <laughs> I love that. And, and actually, the, the the concept of setting them up in, in your model and then just telling them to do by linked view is pretty neat, too. So so then, you know, in, in that so in that case, what you're saying is you're not you're not asking to go in there and set up all these individual views and filters in their model. You're just asking them to pull that view, essentially right? That, that view data over or, yeah, or and what, whatever you're doing in your, on your end to make for, that view. For, that for sure. And, and, and the way I like to phrase it is in my kickoff meeting, I like to tell the consultants, and, and this is true. This is not like lip service. Like we're here to help everybody kick as much butt as we can. So if they want to create the views, we'll give them a dynamo graph that automatically makes the views. Mm-hmm. If they want to set them to buy linked view and use ours, we'll give you the name of the view to use. If you want a TPS or transfer project standards, the view templates and the filters, just take it all because right. 
the interesting thing is our filter that does this is called includes plumbing or requires plumbing. That's two different filters that we use. Mm -hmm. They can transfer the filter in. It'll work in their file. They don't even need the view template. Right. So it's just like, hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Engineers, tell us what you need mm -hmm. to be successful. And we took the same approach with interiors in, in the other model that you were looking at is, you know, this was a, uh, I, I think I said that when we started out this project, where'd it go? When we started out this project, architecture and interiors were in two separate files. And we were going through all the same thing. And this one even uses publish and consume on BIM 360. Mm. So it was like, hey, we moved a wall. We're publishing. Please go consume. <laughs> <laughs> then go reload. Oh. Then move the wall. Oh and and, and consu the, the consuming. Uh, <laughs> and, and I th <laughs> but I think this is an important part as it relates to the people issue uh, in our workflows in our industry. So the conversation that we first had with the interior designers is like, hey, we don't want to make you uncomfortable with our uppity Revit demands because we are snobs about our models. But what would you need to feel comfortable just marrying back up and being in one model? And in this case, again, ARC and ID are all in one company. So yeah. it was just a question of, let's say we're all going to jump in one model. What do you need? Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to be overbearing, but everybody's going to be a lot happier for in one file. And it was like, well, you know, we do some non-standard stuff because we really care about this thing looking correct. So it might not all be proper content. You know, you might not like where some of the content comes from and everything. And this is where like, again, with your MEP engineers, your structural engineer and your, your IDs, your interior designers, if you bend over backwards a little bit to help them with the stuff that we're better at just because we've been in Revit 15 years longer, mm -hmm. you get the benefit of, oh, we're not in like five separate models and we're not having to like, you know, FTP things, you know, uh, like, again, I just went back to, hey, listen, if we're all in one model, I have to do the publish and consumer for you. You don't have to do it anymore. And they were like, yeah, all right, yes, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I can just work? I don't have to think about it? That's awesome. And then I forgot to publish. So that's what happens on three. I published the model and forgot that that's different from publishing a package, which, yep, yep. whatever. And you can only schedule a publish, uh, you know, a certain amount of times. And oh, it's, yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal. Um, okay, so, so no, that, this is awesome. I get, before we move, so, oh my God, it's already 10. Wow. Uh, we didn't even hit landscape yet. So let's. Oh, man. Let's, <laughs> Let's do this. Let's. I, I I had one question that I that I know is is probably out there in in the chat on in tears, and then maybe we'll just do some quick some quick chat about landscape and for sure thoughts, for just sure. So that we we touch on it and yeah, I mean, definitely. potentially uh, we can just have another episode uh, uh, next season on just landscape. We'll probably do that. Maybe we can even bring you and Lauren on or something like that. That'd be kind of fun. for sure. But um, so, so my my question is actually um, the question I get a lot is is and this is less about the integration but i guess it could depend on it is really just how how does aaron Mahler handle finish schedules and finish plans and oh absolutely <laughs> absolutely oh my gosh i, I love <laughs> i love this question um and actually so just just for the expediency sake i'm gonna actually go do that in the blank file and my computer is way blow up on you <laughs> yeah it's really mad about having all this stuff open at the same time but we're gonna get it It'll come it's back. just it's just in the other session. Ooh, actually, one of them just vanished, but that's cool because that wasn't the one we wanted. <laughs> that's why I open multiple when yes. I'm in a live a live thing. So yeah, the way we handle this, I actually really enjoy. I'm gonna just model uh, four quick walls, and we'll call them brick. And what we do, so exterior finishes and interior finishes all go in one finish schedule, but you can parse them out if you want using mm -hmm. our method. We just we just don't. Um, so we're going to just put some walls in here. Now, obviously, if you're smart, you don't model your bricks backwards, but if you do, it's fine. Interior so, bricks, okay. <laughs> so, you know, all all objects have materials, and of course, this thing's going to make me name it before I tag it. So let's just don't name your views like this or I'll come punch you. <laughs> um, but essentially, when we start, uh, all the materials in our template don't have a, you know, whether you're using type mark or material mark, we use our own shared parameter for it, but basically nothing has a tag value. Hmm. So the material finish schedule already exists. Uh, it's pre-built uh, and it's pre-filtered and it's an actual material takeoff running from the Revit model. So the downside of using a live material takeoff from the Revit model is everything is in here, metal studs, gypsum, you know, every material that goes into your model shows up, except we've told it only if the tag value is greater than blank. Hmm. And the reason that's going to work is because we're not going to tag using the type mark or the item type tag, as we call it. We're hmm. not going to tag that value because why would we tag it for metal studs? But right. the moment I come in and say, this is going to be brick one, 
it now has a value greater than zero and it's automatically going to make me look stupid because what did we, what did we do in here? And I'm confused about what's going on right now. Uh, phase two. Yeah. What, what are you doing? Wrong, I think you're in the wrong phase. Oh, did I model this in phase two? Oh, you're yeah. awesome. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I, I got to move the walls, don't I? Okay. So <laughs> I, it's late. I've got, yeah, we it's just put good. the kids to bed. I'm like an idiot right now. Okay. So yeah. So what will happen is the moment you type in brick one, uh, everything is now showing up in terms of the finish schedule. And we also have all the materials pre-classified. So you'll get bricks together. You'll get ceiling tiles mm -hmm. together. You'll get flooring together. So everything shows up just by nature of it. And I want to be clear because some folks get confused. The tag is not the requirement. It's just that in our normal workflow, somebody goes to tag the material and it's blank, and then they fill it in. So it's not a requirement that you tag things. You're really just filling it in in the Revit material. Yeah, Doing so, just, the, the tag makes it easier to do that too. To be fair. sure, I mean, it's, it's sure, yeah, <laughs> for sure. In that in, and so, so, so in that case, then um, that, that's a great that's a great tip. So all all your materials are are essentially blank, right? Because of, yes, you know, and using. And there's something else that we do because of what we the feedback that we hear from people who are doing finishes a lot. And I don't want to just I don't want to. Um, I don't want to corral and say that's always interior designers, but whether it's interior designers doing finishes or architectural specifiers, mm -hmm. they come to us a lot and they say the problem with this workflow is we often have to put a finish schedule together and the model's not there yet. Mm. So what do we do then? That's why we just type it out as a bunch of trashy text. Right. So our template actually has what we call the material finish garden. <laughs> and this is... It's a modeled view. It's not drafted. This is a modeled view where we've just laid out some tables and we've said, this is where tile base can go. This is where carpet can go. This is where ceilings can go. But these are actually just little families. Hmm. But they're families with an instance parameter for what material do you want to put on them. So you don't have to sit here and like edit type, duplicate, yeah, make yeah. a floor and call it ceiling tile. Like how many of you have seen a floor <laughs> called ceiling tile? <laughs> Oh, so the yeah. nice thing is I take these things and maybe I'm in a hurry because like I've got to get my pricing set out and I just start banging these things across here mm -hmm. and I start assigning materials to them. Now, the downside is when you're doing the model approach, if brick one now disappears from the building, brick one will come out of the material finish schedule. Mm -hmm. But if somebody has put brick one in here, it will then stay in the finish schedule. So it's both right. a blessing and a curse, right? right. Right. So the official party line is this thing exists just for like early design when you need to make sure the finishes are all listed or for those, you know, persnickety categories that like Revit won't schedule materials on, mm -hmm. you know, I'm looking at you like wall base <laughs> or wall sweeps where the right, material is right. scheduled. Yep. But, but what actually ends up happening is that interior designers end up just like populating everything here instead. And then we just have to make sure the stuff's actually used in the model, which is not the end of the world. No. Really no. cool benefit of this, by the way. Um, not many folks actually set up shared material libraries the full way that Autodesk allows you to do. Mm -hmm. But just to give a 10 second recap, if you have a networked material library saved, you can push your materials to it mm -hmm. and then you can go to another file and then you can load your materials in. What Autodesk doesn't tell folks for some reason is the way these materials come back in sucks. <laughs> they will drop the hatch patterns unless the hatch patterns already exist in the destination file. Mm -hmm. And they will drop any custom parameter that doesn't have a value filled in. So for me, that's not awesome. But these... If you select all of them and you copy and now copy and paste is a bad word at, at Parallax. So <laughs> hear me out. If you copy and paste or save them to a group or save them out as groups and put them in a library, but instead of an ADSK lib, the entire library is individual RVTs with this silly little family in it. Yep. When you load those in the hatch patterns, the keynotes, yeah. the custom parameters all comes in. So we're encouraging clients to actually like build this out, list yeah. the 50 carpets you like to use the most and mm -hmm. just store them somewhere. Yeah. And that becomes uh, your sample file, so to speak, your library absolutely. file that you can bring in. That's a great point. Absolutely. That is something that um, I get, I've gotten asked many times about sharing materials. And that is mm -hmm. my experience with the library as well Is it dumps out all your graphical stuff. It's basically mm -hmm. just the rendered 
it, it yep. seems like it, all it's bringing is the render, the appearance tab, right? And so that's literally yeah. all it brings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which is super uh, annoying. <laughs> and there's there's one more big tip I would give about this, and that is my primary goal is we want all of this to be from the model as much as possible. Right. However, the other downside that we hear from our uh, from our our friends in you know uh, finished selection world, whether that's interiors or otherwise, is that even if you're typing in the schedule, it sucks mm -hmm. because it's slow. Mm -hmm. And it's slow because it's Revit materials. Right. And that's a nasty thing to say, um, but it's true. Mm -hmm. So what I highly encourage all of you to do, and I want to be super clear, none of the products that we use, are, like we're not resellers, we don't get a kickback or anything, but get yourself familiar with any one of the applications that will let you round trip to Excel. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and whether that's CTC, uh, so we use the <clears throat> the spreadsheet link, mm -hmm. but you can also use DRoots and you yep. can go with, I forget if it's sheet link or table chat. Every application developer makes like both of these, like with CTC, I get confused between spreadsheet link and schedule Excel and I have to look. <laughs> <laughs> so it's spreadsheet link in DRoots. I forget which one it is. Um, and that's, you want... just, that's just so you're going to, you're going to batch, you're going to batch input and not have to wait for Revit to catch up every time you input something. <laughs> yeah, so so, so, it, right? so what you're looking at here is this is the spreadsheet link export from mm -hmm. CTC and it's every material in our template. And now I'm coming in here and this is how fast the data entry yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I get done, I just tell CTC, pull it back in and it's immensely faster. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you'll also get way more buy-in from folks who are used to typing finishes and they just don't want to be in this awful interface where like mm -hmm. after a few minutes, I can't even see what I'm typing anymore. Like. <laughs> and then I press enter and my computer spins and freaks out. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like 1992 <laughs> up in here. And uh, I love Revit to death, but this, you know, yeah, this we have, we have the tools now to pop it out to Excel, spend can, 20 minutes be, working over there. We can there. be honest. I mean, we've used Revit. Sure. We can still be honest. Okay. So, so, um, so I think what, what we'll probably do is I think we're probably going to have to do a whole nother episode yeah. of the landscape, but may, maybe just uh, because there may be some folks who showed up uh, based on the, thumbnail and, and title that <laughs> that we're going to talk about landscape design maybe maybe just a quick uh, uh dissertation on on your approach to to, to that to, to absolutely how, how, absolutely how to, work, how to work with those guys for sure and unfortunately what what you'll get now is a picture because that revit session did crash <laughs> <laughs> As long, hey, if you have a picture uh, that's good that's good oh man so <laughs> i mean like i said we're working on this building right now um and again thanks to john marlowe who got these pictures out of our model like right before uh this session um <laughs> when you're looking at it from the aerial the site actually looks flat mm -hmm. um and I love to impress upon people the importance of civil and landscape. If you were to look at this building carefully, there's actually 12 feet of grade change from this side to this side. Mm -hmm. You know, so you'll see that like there are windows on L1 and then the windows kind of stop and then L1 disappears around the side and this door comes up a staircase. And, you know, this is all pretty basic stuff that happens in architecture all the time. You can see it on this side as well. And there's civil on this job, there's landscape on this job, and there's us on this job. And of course, civil isn't seeing anything in 3D other than what they've drawn in civil 3D, which no offense to civil 3D, but that doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> landscape is working in, in flat CAD right now. And so there was a conversation for us on this building of there's brick and there's there's stem walls you know, on half the building mm -hmm. and half the building's partially underground and there's CMU under there and where do all the steps happen? And I'm like, this is a silly problem because it's not really that difficult. And so if you have good enough tools, like one of the tricks is the first best thing you can do is just go into a separate site file and model the whole site flat. Just pretend it's flat, trace everything because at least then you have it started mm -hmm. and you've got something that you can use for reference. Mm -hmm. Now, the way we actually do ours, uh, and I'm so, I'm so annoyed that file crashed. I'm so annoyed. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm tempted to just see how long it would take for it to open again. Uh, so what we actually do is using foreground. Um, foreground is built by Lauren Schmidt, who's at Parallax team. She's a landscape architect. We're actually going to be showing this off at ASLA National uh, starting tomorrow night. Yep. So and Lauren you were going to be the there show almost a yes. year ago now. So I'll yes. put a link to, to when she came on as yes. well. So, so uh, you guys can see some, I believe we, we talked about some general principles, but we also showed some foreground stuff. So yeah, absolutely. But I mean, so I want to give it its I want to give it its real due diligence. So our total time investment. So John and I built this entire landscape model. We got the grading files from Civil and Landscape. Um, let's just say at like dinner time or whatever lunchtime. Uh, we spent about forty five minutes reviewing them together to understand like what was existing grading and what was new grading, and that's because these were like raw preliminary mm -hmm. files. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to, I'm going to estimate on the high side and say, John, maybe I don't remember how long it was. Let's call it two hours to just trace everything flat mm -hmm. and call it, you know, this is flat landscaping. Yep. Um, I spent maybe 75 minutes using foreground to grade all this. Hmm. So we're not talking about days or weeks of work and the benefit that we're getting out of it. I mean, already we've had two coordination meetings with structure and with the rest of the architecture team about where windows were going to have to change elevation and exterior wall compositions were going to have to change. And this retaining wall is now manifesting out of nowhere because we need another exit door and that's going to have to come up some stairs because of the grade change. And we verified exit door locations and every single exit door in this building is at a different elevation, you know, for the most, with the exception of like those two, to be fair. But all of that coordination is already happening. And we invested, what, three hours to, and, and I mean, the longest part was tracing the yeah. landscape file. Yeah, the 2D <laughs> tracing, I know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and, I mean, and again, also keep in mind, 45 minutes of it was because we didn't know what we were looking at. So we right. were like, you know, understanding it. And, and the big portion of this, there, there is a whole, and this, this is not an advertisement, but, you know, there's, there's, you know, if you don't want something like foreground on Lauren's old blog, landarcbim.com, which she occasionally still puts stuff on, but all of, all of foreground originated mm -hmm. from Dynamo Logic that Lauren's been building out over the years. Like mm -hmm. if you want to do this for free without an application, you can do it. The point is it's now possible to model it. So whether you're doing it with foreground or not, right. it's value adding to go in and model it. And all you need to make that possible is a series of a few good view templates um, and the ability to basically draw floors. And that's the important thing is these are all floors. None of this is Topo. Mm -hmm. um, Revit Topo is dead to me. So it's all floors. It's all shape edited. The curbs <laughs> are all railings. But you'll notice that we have legit, like the, the, the street is down the six inches from the curb. We don't have the curbs in in this image because I mm -hmm. accidentally deleted them. Don't ask. And now are you, are you doing that in a... Um, uh... A separate site model or you're doing that in the in the main architectural model i always recommend site being a different model um, and actually somebody asked a question at the very 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 beginning before we even really got talking and i do want to just circle back and answer that question because it's very near and dear to my heart that mm -hmm. question was with the advances in software over the years do you now think like more discipline should all be in one model mm -hmm. or has it not advanced enough <laughs> and uh, I've got a very practical approach to that, and that is architecture and interiors should always all be in a model, if you can, because the benefits there, as we've talked about, there's just so many benefits there. Um, but you always want to look at what are the benefits and what are the potential risks. Mm -hmm. Site, there's not a whole lot of upside to being in the same file as the building, particularly when the building may change elevation relative to the site. Right. So we do have the site in an entirely separate file, and I always recommend folks do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just not a huge downside. Another one, and I just want to, I, again, this was a great question that somebody asked at the beginning because I never get asked this question. Um, working with a structural engineer that we collaborate very tightly with, um, when we did the reconciliation model for Dickey's Arena, there was a portion of it where architecture and structure were in the same model. Hmm. And there were some upsides, but I think it's very important for everybody to know the downsides there. And that is those of us that represent architecture are not aware of how much slower the software is when it does analysis. So, oh yes, oh, <laughs> me yes. being me being just in a in a in a construction coordination architecture model where I was in there with structure and all structure was modeling in there was concrete and CMU, and Scott would take a run at joining geometry on two hundred walls in the slab, and my sink with central would take thirty minutes. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to structure and MEP, I do think you want to stand your ground and kind of stay in separate files simply so that everybody's not paying the same tax on sync with central. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and of course, add some trusses or some open web trusses in there. Oh my God. Those things are brutal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you start, you start dealing with like the, you know, the compiling number of warnings because, you know, MEP systems are disconnected and everybody's angry and, you know, there's diminishing returns on being in the same model when those disciplines don't really have the you know the only thing you're solving being in one model is we don't have to have two air terminals right and guess what then we don't agree on what the air terminal should look like <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i do i think i think that's a great point and, and that's kind of been my response too is like i think yeah i think computing power and software has gotten to the point where yeah in theory you could build full full models right and for sure for, the, for sure but but we also cloud technologies and live linking and like have also made it 
not ne the, the issues of linking don't really exist as much as they used to, which was, you know, the big issue to me was always the, the delay of the FTP jockey. Right. And, and oh yeah, of course. You know, of course. So, I mean, so the fact that that's gone now means it's like, well, it doesn't really, you know, we're, we're and now we're talking about this redundancy approach, which is, I think helpful in that collaboration effort. And so, um, I think that's a, that's a, that's a valid yeah. point. If we have time, there is a cool question. So, sure. so Justin is Justin is just asking. So, is this because landscape wasn't modeling a surface in Civil 3D that we could pull in? Mm -hmm. So, there is a surface in Civil 3D, and and again, I'm not kind of begrudging Civil 3D and the whole <laughs> workflow, but you know, the Autodesk marketing apparatus would tell you that like pulling in a Civil 3D surface and draping it as a topo surface is sufficient, but it doesn't really fit the bill when we're used to seeing you know sidewalks and parking lots with discrete six inch drops and curbs as, as native elements. So if you pull in a topo surface from Civil 3D, your option to get it all broken out as correct objects is to like split surface a thousand times. Mm -hmm. And we want to actually go in and look at the landscape drawings and the landscape details. And we want to say, okay, this sidewalk or this paver type has this kind of bed and this planting area is on this depth of soil, mm -hmm. um, particularly when it's on structure landscape, like this type of coordination um, and the Navisworks file did open, so that's kind of fun. I mean, this this project, when we did this deck where there was planting and there were, you know, decks and and pavers and everything sitting on top of a roof structure, how this all went together, you know, a, a, a civil 3D surface that turns into a Revit terrain is never going to emulate everything happening here in section correctly. So using foreground to get all of this modeled and we've got deck and we've got pavers and we've got more pavers and then we've got slopes underneath and then we've got, you know, concrete walls. Being able to see all of this in section is is the the prime kind of win that we're after here. Yeah. Um, and that's not to disparage Revit Topo surface. It's just. No, you can disparage it. I mean, <laughs> I, I will tell you from experience that my, you know, uh, I may not need to drop in curbs and stuff a lot of times when I'm using the, the topo surface, but when you get large topo surfaces, even though when they're made from civil 3d and even when they come in real clean, sure. Um, the simple editing, finishing and, and actual usage of them, uh, it gets very taxing, right? I mean, it's, it's absolutely, a, you know, even adding sub regions, clicking finish and waiting forever, adding a pad click, like it just, the, 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 the amount of time that you're dealing with, um, where, you know, for, for me, for example, if I'm doing excavation studies and stuff, a lot of times I'll drop a pad in down to the lowest level and I'll just use yep. floors yep. to contour everything up because it's Absolutely. Like, these yeah. things just crank, yeah. you know, and if I yep. sat there and tried to grade the thing, it would take me four hours just to click finish and wait for Revit or, you know, for Windows to stop spinning. So Absolutely. And, and high res too, just asked in the chat, like, what about stuff that's on structure or on parking decks? And that's actually one of the things that got me first looking at using floors. Yeah. Yeah. And that then led me to find Lauren because this project, the garage was the entire site. Right. And mm -hmm. Revit topo surface just wouldn't let you carve you out under it. it. Right. So this was done. Don't don't mind my tacky grass rendering. But I mean, so this was done with floors that were shape edited so that we could actually simulate how tall the grass was going to be on top of the structure. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first times I was like, geez, somebody has to be doing this better. And then we found Lauren's blog and it was like, wouldn't it be cool if this wasn't Dynamo? I mean, we love Dynamo, but <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if it wasn't? And yeah, if you're if you are from landscape and you're going to be at uh, ASLA, I'll be in booth 864. Come by if you just want to hang out. We'll show you some fun. Yeah, stuff. I'll be interested to touch base um, after that, too, because I mean, one of the things, you know, I'm interested to see how 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 much landscape architects are are gravitating towards this or not. <laughs> I know, you know, the ones that I've worked with, um, they definitely see the benefits of being able to represent their stuff in 3D as yes. far as designing wise. Right. Where you know, forever they've you know, they've. Mm -hmm. mostly been illustrative site plans and then maybe some some sketches or you know rendering and so be, like, there's definitely some benefits to that but i'm curious to see um you know how that all develops because it, realistically revit's not a great tool for organic landscape design oh. per se as a you know <laughs> and so so I'm, I'm you know i think for for what you're saying it makes sense that it, it's it's worth all the time and effort which isn't really that much time and effort when you really think about it too build your landscape design team's stuff in your model as as you know for, for reference for for visual reference and, and so on yeah you know and that's and that's what i'm doing on this job and and that's why it's fun for us to talk about but i'll tell you you know i'll grant you that revit wasn't originally a landscape design tool mm -hmm. um, but when you start piling on things that the api can do like with foreground it actually becomes a lot more um 
accessible right. for landscape architects. And what's interesting to me there is not like what what we're doing on the parallax architectural side. I mean, so Lauren has full landscape architecture clients now that we're building. Like there is a version of the parallax template that is all for landscape. That's awesome. um, and, and it's amazing. It's, it's uh, you know, but then there's also like landscaping content and, you know, you get into real site features and real site design. Um, and this is a model that Lauren built, of course, you know, for a client. But what's interesting about it is uh, landscape architects are finally now getting pressured more mm. to jump into the 3D world. And I think that's because, you know, design teams are starting to see that this is actually possible. We actually have uh, a construction client who's using foreground because they got tasked with modeling uh, the underground utilities that are all kind of design spec at X number of inches under the ground. Yep. And it's like, well, where is the ground? Welcome to my life. <laughs> right, exactly. And so, <laughs> and so of, we're the actually- The amount of underground yeah. utilities I've modeled in the last couple of years in my team is just ridiculous. And it's mostly and so, because it exists only in two dimensions for the most part, I mean, yep. you know, and, 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 you know, there's, oh, absolutely. there's a yeah. huge advantage to having it, you know? Yeah. Dimensions. I mean, yeah. Utilities is what drove all of this as well. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, where it's really getting interesting there is what, what we're experiencing is landscape architects are now getting asked more for it. And I would say what I'm really curious about at ASLA this weekend is the most interesting thing is because they haven't looked seriously at it yet a lot of landscape architects don't yet realize what Revit won't do. Hmm. So before you show them something like foreground, you know, or the other products out there that do similar things, it's not about like, Hey, here's how we're solving this problem. First, we have to break the bad news, which is, Hey, do you know how bad Revit is? At this? <laughs> right, right. Here, go try this. Uh, Let us know what you think. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I mean, we're, we're seeing some great results. There's a lot of, there's a lot of great projects out there. And I think, I mean, it is now fast enough that it's, it's a lot like interiors where for us, if you're on the architecture side, the benefit is there simply for you to do it after your landscape team designs. And at least then you can have those coordination meetings and say, Hey, you know, you're showing in this site section that this, that this, you know, seat has this foundation under it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a water line there and we can at least have those conversations now instead of when they're trying to build that bench. So yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. I, I think whether it's Revit or not, I think the more, the more landscape designers that, that are using 3d is, is only going to be beneficial. Uh, Cause uh, you know, the reason why we're saying it's beneficial to remodel it or to model it is, is, you know, or why it's, why it's worth the time is because of the benefits we see with you downstream so definitely. absolutely awesome. absolutely so i think i think we can wrap it up there um we'll, we'll, we'll we could do a whole another episode on landscape but we did talk about it quite a bit so i'm not i'm not too upset about it <laughs> but but i love this this is awesome for, uh uh you know when it comes to the interior design the 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 ideas of the re redundancy and some of the approaches to it i think i think i think that could be a, a light bulb moment for a lot of people out there even not just interior designers so i appreciate that i'm sure everyone here does um, and, uh, I will make sure that any of the links that Aaron mentioned, I will try to get in the description here on the blog. If I miss some and Aaron checks them out, he'll make sure to send me the ones that I missed and I'll put those down there as well. Um, I thank you guys for, for hanging out, uh, with us for, and pretty much everyone stayed on, uh, the entire hour and a half, which is awesome. So thank you guys for, for hanging out with us. And, Sorry. Uh, I talk a lot. <laughs> no, it's not even, it's, it's, if it wasn't interesting, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't keep going. I can promise you that because I, <laughs> I would shut it down, man. I'm just kidding. Nice. Uh, nice. <laughs> and so Aaron's going to be at, uh, what was it? At Landscape, uh, uh, ASLA, ASLA National ASLA, in San Francisco. American yeah. Landscape yeah. Architects, right? So, so anyone out there, uh, who, who may be going to that conference, make sure that you guys check out the, the Parallax booth and say hi to those guys. Uh, definitely check out, uh, Parallax website, Aaron, uh, Aaron on Twitter. I'll make sure to, uh, post a link to your Twitter as well, which is twice road fool, right? Twice road was it twice road fools twice <laughs> twice roads fool <laughs> right I, I, whatever i'll put a link to it down below <laughs> any any final words before we heads up, uh, uh close it up here uh just model model it all if anybody you know if anybody that's ever it. asked you hey should we model this yes absolutely yes, always always yeah. and that's usually my thing is like just try first if it's really really that challenging we can talk about it but yes just try it let's let's see what happens <laughs> awesome man well aaron thank you for joining me again i'll definitely have you and someone from the team back on i'm sure in the future um for those of you uh joining us and hang out in the chat thank you guys for being so cool and having some great questions make sure you guys awesome head questions over to, uh yeah awesome. community.bimafterdark.com to check out the um private community there check out my courses and see what it's all about and uh yeah aaron we'll talk soon man and everyone else absolutely uh, we'll see it we'll see you next time all right you all have a good night mm -hmm.